Good morning and welcome. But by the way, you can see I'm still podium bound because my lapel mic is still being repaired. I want to speak today about how problems are answered prayers. And you know, Becky and I have been talking lately about how we're going to be doing a five-week workshop on Derek Rydell's book, Emergence. And I want to begin today by just covering something that Derek writes about in the book, because it's so relevant to, to this morning's message. He says the universe is always preparing us for something greater to emerge, even in times when we're facing chaos and confusion. He said what we, what we need to become is what W. Clement Stone called inverse paranoids, someone who believes that the universe is always plotting for them. So I want to ask you a question. What would your life be like if you really believed this and really loved it, that the universe was plotting for our good? If, if we did, we could become enriched by any event that Al pictured in our life. We could ask ourselves, how could I take this event and use it to grow and to be more? We could take difficult situations and accept them. Not only accept them, we could bless them because we would know that's an opportunity for us to begin a new chapter in our life. And you know, the truth is that few of us live like this because we're afraid of change. And yet, if we ignore this evolutionary call, it still needs to find release. And so it may do it in destructive ways, like perhaps a financial issue in our life, an illness, a difficulty in a relationship. And what I want to tell you this morning is those aren't punishments. They're wake-up calls. The universe is saying to us, you've settled for too small a life. And when you think about that, that's a compliment. The universe is saying to us, you could be more. You could be bigger. You're more powerful than you know. You need to have a bigger vision of who you could be. You know, I saw a quote recently, and I like it so much, I keep it on my desk. It says, we cannot be what we cannot see. Crisis help us to burn away our limited vision of who we are. And, and what we need to do is accept everything, everything about ourselves. We need to accept our shadow self. And when we do that, we come to see we're not broken, that it's all okay. We learn that we are divine creatures of God. And we need to believe this and to practice it and to follow it, not once, not twice, but all the time because the universe is always conspiring for our good. It's preparing us for greater things. So let, let me bring home the point with an example, and I want to tell you a fable. And this is a fable about a king whose best friend is one of his ministers in the government. And the minister has a quirk that people have come to accept. And the quirk is, whenever something happens in his life, no matter what it is, he says, that is good, that is good. Well, one day, they're out in a hunting party, and there's a terrible accident, and the king loses a toe. And when the minister sees it, he goes, that is good, that is good. And the king, in his agony, says, what do you mean this is good? And he has his friend arrested and thrown into prison. Months later, 
when he's all recuperated, the king takes another hunting party out, and somehow he gets separated from the group, and he gets captured by a tribe, a different tribe. And this tribe has a belief that any prisoner they capture has to be sacrificed to their gods. And they take the king back to their camp, and as they're preparing him to be sacrificed, they see he's missing a toe, and they realize they can't sacrifice him because he's not whole, and they can only sacrifice people that are whole. So they release him. He goes back, the king goes back to his kingdom, and he calls for his friend, and he tells him what just happened, and he said, tell me, he said, why is it when I was injured, you said, that is good, that is good. And when the guards were taking you to the prison, they heard you say, that is good, that is good. Why? And the minister looked at the king and said, because something good always comes out of everything. Something good always comes out of everything. And he said, look, if I wasn't in jail, I'd have been with you. And when they didn't sacrifice you because of your toe, they would have sacrificed me because I have all my body parts. And the king looked at him and he said, you're right. And he pardoned him. The point is, how we respond determines how we move through life. You know, Albert Einstein once said that every human being needs to answer the question, is the universe a friendly place or not? And he said, many of our values and our beliefs come forth from how we answer that question. And Viktor Frankl, the, psychologist, uh, the psychiatrist who was in prisoner of war camps uh, throughout World War II, he said those who were successful in the concentration camps were those who could create ritual out of horror, those who could create growth out of destruction. And he said they did that by believing there was some kind of transcendent meaning in, in what was happening, happening to them. And when we do that, when we can do that, we don't see ourselves as prisoners or as victims. I want to read to you my favorite Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. He said, "'Tis not in the high stars alone, nor in the cup of bloody budding flowers, nor in the red breast's mellow tone, nor in the bow that shines in flowers, but in the mud and scum of things, there always, always, something sings. Erwin Kula is a rabbi who has written books and has appeared on TV. He's been on Oprah. And one of the books he wrote was titled Yearnings. And in that book, he talks about how when he does workshops or speaks in front of audiences, he'll very often ask them how they define the word holy. And some of the responses he gets are pious, serene, untouchable, beyond every day, someone who is holy has arrived. But he said, yet, you know, holiness is available in every moment, in every place. But many times we miss it, either because it's too subtle or it's too scary. So we repress it. And he said, yet the ability to live with seeming contradictions is what gives birth to wisdom. And he gives an example in his own life. One year, his wife was pregnant, and they were out with friends, friends home, for Rosh Hashanah dinner. And his wife began to feel some contractions. And later on, the contractions got more and more pronounced. So they got up and they walked to the hospital 
which was a few blocks away. And five hours later, she gave birth to a beautiful little girl. Um, Kula said she was the perfect child, and he was joyous. And he said, but then he had a thought that knocked the wind out of him. And the thought was that about a year before, his wife had suffered a miscarriage. And if she hadn't suffered that miscarriage, this new little girl, Talia, would not be in the world. And he said, in that moment, he was filled with sadness and with peace. He felt terror at the memory. And he felt gratitude in the moment. And he said it wasn't that the birth made the miscarriage okay. What it was, was realizing that chaos and coherence were indistinguishable. Chaos and coherence were indistinguishable. Pain is a universal experience. None of us escape life without it at one point or another. And yet, experiences of pain can lead us to transformation because we get to choose how we're going to respond to it. You know, Ernest Holmes once wrote, train yourself to think what you wish to think, to be what you wish to be, to feel what you wish to feel, and don't place any limits on spirit. He's telling us that we can train our thought. We can move beyond limiting ideas and limiting beliefs. So I, I want to talk to you about another rabbi whose name was Pesach Kraus. And he wrote a book titled, Why Me? Coping with Grief, Loss, and Change. When he was a young boy, he lost a leg. And as an adult, his wife died from a brain tumor. When that happened, he left his congregation and became the head Jewish chaplain at a large cancer hospital in New York City. And he writes that what he learned from the patients is that we each must find meaning in our life, in our own way. And he said, in that environment, some of the patients can pass through pain and despair to find meaning. And he gives a couple of examples. He, he writes about a businessman who said, that he sacrificed everything for work. He sacrificed his wife. He sacrificed his children. And he was considered his huge success. And he said, now none of that means anything to me. It's like I'm born anew. I realize it's life that is precious. And he writes about a young boy who's, high school, who's a high school basketball star who had a bone marrow transplant. And he told the rabbi, I've learned so much. I know who I am and what it is that I want. And the rabbi wrote, the hard knocks of life can lead to the revealing of doors, to the opening of new possibilities. So I want to give you an exercise. And you can try it this week. You can take it into meditation, you can write on it, or just think about it. Ask yourself why a door in your life has closed and what wisdom and experience has been left behind for you. Why a door closed and what wisdom and experience has been left behind for you. You know, the Sufis have a teaching tool called Nasruddin. And scholars argue whether Nasrud was a real person or just a teaching tool. But one of the stories that is written about him is Nasrud decided 
that he was going to plant a garden. So he did. And when it bloomed, he had flowers and he had weeds. And he wanted to get rid of the weeds. So he saw some of his friends who had gardens, and he asked them. And no matter what they told him, it didn't work. So he decided to go see the royal gardener. And the royal gardener gave him a whole bunch of suggestions. And he had already tried all of them, and none of them worked. So they sat together in silence. And finally, after a few minutes, the gardener, the royal gardener looked at him and said, well, I suggest then that you get to love them. And I think the lesson in that is it's life. And we need to learn to love it all. So you all know that I like to end my messages with some kind of inspirational quote. And I came to two this week, and I couldn't decide which one to use, so I'm going to do them both. The first one is from Ernest Holmes, who wrote, I shall keep the promise that I have made to myself. I shall never again tell myself that I am poor, sick, weak, nor unhappy. I shall not lie to myself anymore, but shall daily speak the truth to my inner soul, telling it that it is wonderful and marvelous, that it is one with the great cause of all life, truth, power, and action. I shall whisper these things into my soul until it breaks forth into songs of joy, realizing the limitless of its limitless possibilities. And the second quote a friend put on Facebook, and it's by Anonymous, and even though we're a couple of weeks into the new year, I think it's so beautiful and so relevant, I want to share it with you. I'm walking into 2018 with a clear heart and mind. If you, were, if you owe me, don't worry about it. You're welcome. If you wronged me, it's all good. Lesson learned. If you're angry with me, no argument, you've won. If we haven't spoken, it's cool. I love you, and I wish you well. If you have, feel I have wronged you, I apologize. It's never intentional. Life is too short for all the pent-up anger, holding grudges, pride, spite, extra stress, drama, and pain that comes along with it. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.